they should have just gotten a message for it. A message for it. Show my screen. Yes. <laughs> all yes. right. Thank you exactly. all for your patience with me. This is somewhat new, so I need to pull up my PowerPoint. And I don't know how much of it you can see or what else you can see, but if we're ready, we'll leap in with that then. So we are a new phenomena in the Winston-Salem area. Uh, our market really is in its infancy, or at least I like to think of it that way, because I like to think about it growing up uh, and growing stronger and staying uh, on the Winston-Salem scene. Uh, for our year one, we really were what I would describe as location-driven. And was a, do you want to open the slideshow so that we can see it on I your think full screen? I thought I was. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's okay. So how do I do that, actually? Up, I think up at the top it says slideshow. Or there you go. There we go. Is that working now? Perfect. Yes. All right. Well, thank you. And I had a friend who helped me with all my little, my little guys and my little illustrations. I'll try to keep this moving. So by location driven, what I mean is that we had no real organization. Uh, we had a wonderful coffee shop downtown Winston-Salem. They literally gave us a roof uh, over our head the first day. It was a very rainy day, but people showed up, and it turned out to kind of turn into the same people uh, at the same place around the same time and around the same day. Uh, we ultimately got some posters uh, up and out once we discovered that we really were a market, and people started coming. But initially, it was kind of an open secret uh, that uh, you sort of had to know about and find out about in order to find your way downtown to the coffee shop, Cranky's, in fact, where our market was operating. Uh, we wanted to keep it going. So year two, we uh, found a sponsor in the sense that many of the people who'd been uh, principals and getting uh, the, the growers to come down and, and be available downtown were members of the food co-op. I'm also on the board of the food co-op and we were so excited to see this happening in downtown Winston-Salem that we convinced our board to essentially take over the operation and give it a little bit more structure. Uh, we had a very active volunteer who served as market manager. The co-op agreed to take responsibility for city permits. That volunteer market manager uh, also was very involved with engaging in farmer selection because the original idea was to make this a producer's only market. We had scheduled volunteers. We had announced hours. I mean, we really turned into a market in the sense that we were outdoors on the street, uh, had events, had a printed calendar, and began to look like, in fact, a real farmer's market and promoted ourselves uh, as a producers only market. That was a big uh, decision for us, but it was critical to our operation. We didn't have necessarily, um, I would say, formal procedures or protocols for selection. It had a lot to do with the knowledge and commitment of our market manager, uh, who was so instrumental in getting us going. And that was year two. That was actually 2010. Uh, we looked around, saw how wonderful it was, and knew that we wanted to do it again. So last year, was year three for us. Last year, we made a big step. It was really more than the food co-op could handle. We wanted to expand. We wanted to continue. We wanted to take on other kinds of educational missions and other partnering relationships in the community. Carolina Farm Stewardship was gracious enough to formally become a fiscal agent for us. Under their bylaws, they had the authority to create a regional committee. And with the uh, involvement of and support of their executive director, Roland McReynolds, we became a formal regional committee under Carolina Farm Stewardship Association. So unlike year two, in year three, we had some real insurance. We were able to solicit donors. We were able to apply for and receive grant funding for a paid manager. Carolina Farm Stewardship Association was instrumental in uh, bringing about a budget process for us uh, so that we were not just reactive in, in what we needed or wanted, but actually had a proactive planning process for budgeting. And I'm using the word process a lot because I think that's an uh, important theme in the discussion today. We had a policy process. We had an application process. We had a selection and appeal process. And by process, I mean that we not only had a series of steps and events 
uh, markers along the way to admission into the market, we had a structure and an organization that supported the implementation of those processes from articulation of the policy in written form through a written application process and through a selection and appeal process that guarantees the integrity of our market and has, I think, really given us the privilege of being Winston-Salem's only producers only market. We're looking forward to this year, getting ready to open up in a few weeks, uh, are developing more partnerships in the community and may hopefully even be able to get ourselves to um, a second market location and have two operating markets. Well, I've changed fonts on this next slide so as to show you that we're, we're growing up and we're sort of, you know, straightening up. <laughs> We've got a, a very simple sketch that shows you our structural organization uh, with the regional committee, Carolina Farm Stewardship, and specifically our vendor selection committee uh, that has the liaison to our regional committee. We also call ourselves the steering committee. The vendor selection committee uh, consists of the people who are knowledgeable, uh, who go out and examine and inspect the farms and talk to the growers uh, and make notes about what they see and what they expect and what would be consistent in terms of what we see that grower bringing to the market. The next slide, then, is meant to start the illustration of how our process actually works. So we have vendors who are returning vendors. They have a little heart on them because we know them and we love them. Uh, but we've been able wonderfully to solicit a great many new vendors who are interested in being part of our market uh, because we have, I think, a very positive presence and a brand in that sense in the community. Our application process begins with a form that the regional committee devised a set of market rules that the committee devised, subject to and approved by the Carolina Farm Stewardship Association. That application then comes in and is submitted to the regional committee for, for I'd say, a preliminary review, and then referred to the vendor selection committee who actually does a visit. That review by the, the selection committee is driven by written policies and rules that the regional committee created over long debate and through a very intense process of articulation, uh, which I find very satisfying and enjoyable. It has given me a wonderful education uh, into food systems generally and what it takes to make an effective uh, system, one that protects the market as an asset in the community. A vendor who may not be selected has a right of appeal. Uh, and that was another important part of our procedure, so that our protocol uh, spell out the means by which a vendor who is not admitted uh, to the market has a way of um, appealing and, and getting a determination. Uh, since we're a new market, we understand newness and we want to support new vendors. We want to support those who may be transitioning, but we want to do that in a balanced way that, again, protects the integrity of the market. And with that, I'm very, very honored. I really am delighted and looking so forward to June's presentation today. Um, I want to remind everyone that really there are two themes, ensuring integrity and enforcing standards. They aren't just absolutely synonymous. They do in, involve, I think, imply different parts of the process. June has a wealth of experience and depth of history in both of those aspects. She is with the GROW NYC, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, mm -hmm. June, Green Market particularly. What an impressive organization. I counted 63 market locations on your website. I know June has been active uh, for the boots on the ground as a market manager, uh, starting with uh, GROW NYC in 2004, actually managing several neighborhood markets. And for the last four years, she has been the manager of farm inspections and strategic development for the Green Market uh, Grow NYC project. And boy, does she have a terrific PowerPoint, so I'm going to turn it over to her. But in the meantime, just one quick little technical piece so that all of our listeners know um, there will be an opportunity for you to type your questions in. Know that when you do that, I will be watching them and noting them. You won't get an acknowledgment of your question right away. But at the very end of her presentation, June has agreed to give us some time to respond to those questions, and I'll be relaying them to her then for her to respond to. You will find a link to the Farmers Market Coalition resource page in your user control manual, I'm sorry, panel, user control panel, 
uh, which I, I'm assuming is showing on your screens. I don't see it on mine at the moment, but I'm going to ask Liz to confirm that it's available for you all. At the end of the presentation, when we close the seminar, you'll be invited to complete a customer satisfaction survey. As good market managers, I'm sure you all know how important customer satisfaction is, and that's something we wanted to model for you as well. Uh, to make things a little more fun, there will be some polls, I believe, presented during the seminar to give you a chance to uh, log in on questions of not only policies and how they are created and made, but how they are enforced. Uh, we know that's a toughie, and that's really why we're out there uh, today to help the, help those painful moments when you may have to make an enforcement decision. So with that, I'll turn it over to June because I know she's had to do that and that's what I want to hear from her. So, June? Sure. Thank you, Anne. Um, so I had put this presentation together uh, a couple of years ago for exactly this purpose to help to teach other market operators um, how we do inspections. And it's been a really good process to go through to really keep in mind how how our system works. And um, I am a, I'm a manager at the market, or I think of myself as management. We operate markets. We create spaces so that farmers can come in and, and sell their products. Um, I'm a member of this community. And I think that as we go through the, the PowerPoint, that will come into play a little bit. Um, and it's certainly something that I think most operators struggle with when it comes to having to do inspections and having to do with enforcement in particular. So um, I start out um, the presentation with a quote from Ronald Reagan that says, trust everyone but verify. And uh, that was actually something that I came across one day when I was heading upstate in New York, driving north on 87, which is our big throughway. And Garrison Keillor came on the radio with the Poets Corner and quoted W.C. Field saying, trust everyone but cut the cards. And I started thinking about that and thinking about how very much that was like the work of doing inspections. Um, we're here as advocates, and uh, we certainly want to support our growers and our producers and work for the food system that we want to see. Um, but we have to do our job and make sure that people are who they say they are and, and do what they say they're doing. And we have that responsibility, not just to the farmers, but to our consumers as well. Um, so just to think of you know the big picture, what are what are our inspections for? Um, what is it we're we're trying to accomplish here? Um, every market has a different mission. Um, Green Market's mission is um, all over the place in our documentation. We are here to support regional farmers and bring fresh food to New Yorkers. We create spaces within the city for marketplaces to happen, um, and we're here to support small family farms. Um, your inspections should be tied to that. You always want to go back to what is it you're trying to accomplish. Um, again, this is this is uh, exactly our mission. And you can see this map on the right is the territory of um, our farmers fall within the circle in this region. And that covers New Jersey, eastern Pennsylvania, New York State, up to the Finger Lakes, uh, Vermont, Massachusetts. It's a pretty big area. And that's because New York City is such a powerful marketplace. Um, we thought a lot about brand identity and what that means. Your inspections should be supporting your brand identity. With, with Green Market now, um, we have a very strong brand identity. And when producers come under our banner, they come with the guarantee that, to the consumer that they have been vetted. So your brand has a tremendous amount of value, and that's something to keep in mind. Um, it helps you to establish your authority, I think, also uh, as uh, a, a market operator or as an inspector. Um, we are here to verify producers' claims. Um, and this, again, going back to the brand and the value of this, um, your identity really gives legitimacy to your producers. I see a lot of uh, producers that come to our Union Square market, which a lot of people are familiar with. It's our flagship market. And they may get equally as valuable business outside of that market selling to restaurants or stores or catering companies because people discover them when they walk through our market. 
Um, so it's the, the value of that space and the, legitim the legitimacy that you're giving to the producers is, is big. Um, and uh, we want our inspections to deter people from cheating. And we want to be able to hold those who are accountable to the community. Um, and on the positive aspect, uh, inspections are a foundation for publicity and advocacy. I bring back a lot of information that I share with our publicity department um, that we educate, to, we pass that on to the consumer, we use it in our promotional materials. It gives us a better understanding. Um, and if those of you who have been working in agriculture and definitely with direct marketing, um, this is a really complex field. There's a lot to know, there's a lot to understand about how your producers are operating. Um, and it's all uh, really valuable information. Um, ultimately, I think of us as a, a community and we want to build trust and strengthen our relationships um, within the green market. So going into the nuts and bolts of how we do this and what our system for inspections is, and Ann touched on this a little bit, there's a, a producer application and, and that's really the um, I've started to think more and more of those materials as our first opportunity for inspections. If we are asking for good information from our producers, that helps us. When I go to review somebody's folder in their file, I want to have the information that I need be there. And of course, that's something I've had to learn over, um, I think it's been five years now. Um, the second place is at market with our managers observing the tables, the stands, um, we do inventories, which I'll get into in a little bit. Um, in the fields, that's where your inspector or you as a market operator are going to go. Um, confidentiality is a very important piece of this. Preparing for your inspections, using checklists, um, what sort of follow-up procedures do you have, and then what kind of um, procedures do you have for violations should you find uh, that there are issues. So starting with the intake and the application, um, we ask our producers for a product list, property listing. They need to give us their licenses. If they're doing value-added foods, they need to have a kitchen license on file. And if that needs any scheduled process, we need that. We need dairy licenses, dealer licenses from our um, dairy farms. Um, we like to know. We've gradually keep asking for more specific information. If it's livestock, we want to know breeds. We want to know, are they breeding those animals themselves? Are they purchasing those animals? If they are, where are they coming from? Um, this is all, we'll get into this a little bit later. This is to look at something called transparency, which is definitely a buzzword in our field, um, but it's an important one. Um, we also have an agreement, which again, is something that's essential. It's what's going to give your, you your authority once your producer signs on to this agreement that these are the terms, they come into your marketplace um, under these conditions, and that condition is that they be transparent about what they're doing, basically. Um, and that becomes essential when you have to use that. So here's a sample of a crop plan. We spent a good amount of time, some interns, and um, and staff time to get these. When I started five years ago, these were all handwritten. Um, these are now in Excel, and hopefully they'll go to a database sometime this year. Um, but just to start to give you an idea, on the right-hand side, you'll have the product, and then you'll have a variety. We want to know acres, row feet, planting. Now, a lot of this is going to be really in flux, um, but we try to get the best information that we can. Um, you know, as we see, we're having really warm spring. There's going to be a lot of crops that are going in early. Um, people change up what their crop plans are going to be as they go along. But, uh, and, and we, I don't like to be punitive about that. We just like want to have the best information that we can get. Um, this is a sample of a fruit um, crop plan. And again, I think that um, if you, one thing that's interesting to us, and hopefully once we're able to manage this information better, Looking at these varieties are going to be really interesting and to see how they change over time, especially with direct marketing. And it's one of the assets that we have to farmers markets. So on this page alone, 
Um, well, I guess that's not even that many. I have one. We have one farmer with 87 varieties of apples on their farm, um, and these are things that we really plug and promote about the farmers market because nobody else. There's no grocery store that does that. Um, anyway, just have to make a plug for um, how interesting the information can get. So this is a sample farm map. This is one of my favorite things we get from farmers because um, they're very different and very range very much on detail. And this one is, is largely perennial, so that's not going to change very much. So those are cherry trees and peach trees and raspberries. And um, Whereas someone who's doing vegetable crops is going to have a different plan. Um, but that gives you a starting point, at least, to, of getting oriented on, on the farm. So then we'll go to the market space. Um, we have, yes, we have 63 markets. We have a whole team of managers. And they are the first point of enforcement because they're really the eyes and ears. Nothing, nothing really matters. You could get all of this information from a farmer, but until you see what they're selling on their table, that's what really counts. Um, so you know, some of that is, is we're just paying attention because the strawberries have arrived and we're excited about that. Or, um, and you're just paying attention to what's coming in seasonally. And as our managers get more sophisticated and familiar with things, you know, some things might sort of stand out as, as being um, odd or, or, or there's a huge education process too. I feel a lot of questions from our market managers. And we, we encourage that also. Um, and that the seasonality is part of our publicity and education. And it certainly goes into authenticity and uh, whether or not those things are there when they're supposed to be. Um, and we have market managers doing inventories. We have found those to be really important if, um, if we are onto something that looks like it might be trouble down the road. Because documentation is, is everything. So you have to prove that so-and-so was selling these tomatoes and how much uh, the volume that they're selling, believe it or not. Um, if you're going to penalize somebody for being in violation of your rules, you really you have to have documentation. So um, we teach our managers how to do these inventories um, by starting with an opening inventory and doing a closing one at the end of the day. And there's also units of measure that we look at. These happen to be a style of crate that this one area um, used is it's an area called the black dirt, and almost all the farmers out there have this style of wooden crate. There's also tulip crates. Um, I'm from Michigan. They like to use bushel baskets um, for their farmers markets. So your units of measure start to get standardized within a few different um, container sizes that people use. I emphasize this to our managers. Um, because like I said, when it comes down to really proving that somebody's in violation, um, the documentation is, is essential. Um, we've also found that inventories are, can be very sensitive. Uh, some farmers can be prickly about it, understandably. It's inconvenient. They're coming in. They want to set up. They may or may not be friendly. But again, this is where you go back to the agreement. These are part of the terms of what you agreed to. We can't have transparency unless we do inventories. Um, and we also tell our market managers that they don't, they don't need to be um, dealing with a difficult producer. They can pass that up the chain and we'll deal with that. Um, but to always be courteous and conscientious while you're conducting these. So this is a sample of a product inventory. And um, this is obviously from a meat producer, someone who raises chickens. They put in about an average weight. Um, how many units were in, how many units were left, and then we can tell how many have sold. And this is whether or not this comes down to um, something that would have a penalty to it. This is very good information. It's um, we don't we don't use this in any way to try to find out what sort of an income the farmer is making, but it does give us an idea of what sort of volume is moving through our markets, and that's very interesting. So 
moving out into the field and doing inspections in the field, I think the question of who is doing the inspecting is an important one because the dynamics will be so different. I did the organic inspectors training through the International Inspectors Association, and um, and I've and I know several organic inspectors. Um, we I do a lot of work with NOFA in New York, and they are. I know that NOFA separated out their inspections from their advocacy, and and I can understand why. That certification is now very valuable, and they can't have a conflict of interest. Um, we don't have those parameters yet. Um, like I said, I'm a member of this community. I'm in markets constantly. People know me. I have friendly relationships with some people. If I'm close to some of those farmers, I can't inspect them. I have to send somebody else. Um, it's really important to be aware of your boundaries and stay professional as, as much as possible. So keep in mind that your dynamics are going to be different. If you're the market manager and you have a lot of power within your market and you're stepping out on somebody's farm, that's going to be a really loaded situation. Um, so I don't know if I have advice on how to navigate that except to be aware of it. Um, you can contract inspectors. That can be there's pros and cons to that I've found. Um, there's a familiarity because I know the markets so well, or I know a producer's product that markets so well. I have that much information when I when I much more information when I go out to the farm. Whereas a contract inspector is not quite as familiar with our markets and how we operate. On the other hand, they're much more objective, um, and hopefully they can bring their um, expertise to the inspection. And I've listed here, you know, some options of where you might be able to find inspectors to work with. And I've, over time, um, worked with all these categories. Um, and sometimes just for information, to call up and talk to somebody at Rutgers about strawberry production in New Jersey. Um, so what are we inspecting for when we go out at Green Market? Our big one is is really the producer only rule, and that is that producers must be in full control of production of all products sold at market, except where they are waived by the regulations. So that's um, that's our big one. Traceability, as I had mentioned earlier, um, is somewhat of a buzzword. It refers to the to the ability to verify aspects of production and the process chain for any particular product being sold at market. Um, and I think I'm going to go back to this one just for a second because um, I think that's one of the assets of our marketplace. Um, and I know that Stacy Miller and I, we've talked about this with other folks a bit about uh, the fact that the term local is starting to get used and lots of other advertising venues, and, and we don't really know what that means. And I think that at the farmer's market, if you have a method for traceability, you're going to know exactly what that means. And of course, we don't know everything, um, but we are accountable as management, as the market operator, we are accountable to find that out. And I don't think there are many places in our uh, food system, let alone any of the commerce systems where that happens. So I think that's a real strength of farmers markets. So um, OK, so we have an inspector ready to go out to the field. What do you do? So we have this file of information. We have the application materials. We're going to look at product lists. What properties are they farming? What facilities are they using? Are there all of their licenses up to date? And do we have them on file? Are there previous reports from inspectors who've gone out there? And then we want to take the recent inventories from the market so that we can cross-reference those once we get to the farm. Um, so we're on the farm, and you're really there to verify production. And that's to be able to really assess the products that you have now seen at market and to verify that they have the capability that they are, in fact, in production of those items. 
Um, I find that over time I use audits more frequently. Um, nothing is clearer than an invoice and dates, and um, and it sort of takes out some of the guesswork and some of the um, gray areas, I guess, which you can encounter with people. Um, this is a basic checklist. There should be on the Farmers Market Coalition website some other resources um, that we sent in uh, some years back. I would love to get those updated, but they're definitely useful to, to, heart, to start to help guide you on what to look for. Um, you're going to make sure you see all of the areas of production. You want to identify the crops, the acreage, and and this can be a tremendous amount of information. If you're out on a big 300-acre vegetable farm that's doing, you know, 200 different items, that's a lot to take in. And I think that you just, if you're new to this, you have to give yourself a break. You got to jump in, learn what you can, absorb what you can. And over time, it keeps getting easier the more times you, you step out on a farm. Um, it really helps to have structure, though because you'll be able to keep refining how you gather that information and how you record that information. Um, you want to look at all their equipment. You want to assess their labor. Labor is an important one if they're doing a huge volume um, in production and they say there's only two guys working the farm. That's not so like, likely. Um, it might take you know 25 people to um, do the kind of production that they say there are. they are. Um, there's storage facilities, um, people who are operating winter markets, I, you know, thought that the winter that there wouldn't be any inspections because there's, there's nothing growing, but if you have people at market year-round, you could be doing inspections year-round. Um, storage facilities and proper storage are something that we've started to look at over the winter months. Um, and then you can look at the categories also that aren't weather dependent, like your livestock and dairies. Um, you want to see their packing areas and their packing supplies. You want to cross-check your inventories. I'm going to make one little note, one thing that has definitely changed since I originally made this was, was attention to food safety. Um, it's not our, it's not our job to be um, monitoring, but I think with the issues around food safety and the GAPS program, farmers should be following some basic on-farm food safety practices. So. If you see something that doesn't look so good, you definitely want to address that with the farmer. Um, I think we have a responsibility to do that. Uh, on this page, there's a sample of a couple of invoices of what it would look like. Um, according to our rules, you have to raise your chickens from day-old chicks. There are hatcheries across the country that provide those. So you can see on this one invoice, uh, it says 100 broiler chicks. And there's a date. And so if someone were in production of meat birds, generally you would see one of these every two weeks. Uh, are they pastured? Are they indoors? Are they corn fed? Those are going to be two different production aspects. So um, for example, our folks who do pastured chickens, they may only buy chickens for eight weeks because that's how long their season is before they can get a bird to full market weight. Um, the second invoice is for feed, and that's something else that you want to see match up. Um, if they're truly in production, they're going to be, at, with any kind of animal, there's going to be a source and there's going to be some sort of feed. Um, just to address confidentiality for a minute, um, it is critical to inspections. I had signed an agreement with the organization to only discuss certain matters with the director or the executive director. Um, and it's also important to communicate to staff and managers that they need to have some level of discretion as well. People really like to talk. Um, it is so, and the producers love to get you to talk, and it can get very, you can get lulled into that easily. And um, just a word of caution that that can turn out not very well sometimes. So um, confidentiality, I think, on sort of a legal aspect, and then also to respect that um, 
we have access to producers' livelihoods, their, their whole operations. We have to enter that with uh, a level of awareness and um, abide by confidentiality. And then pretty much just address this slide about um, chatter and the fact that people really like to talk about each other a lot. And sometimes at market, you know, with farmers, that seems to be where their outlet is. Um, so they may be looking to to get get some juicy information on that day that they're there. Um, but you just want to steer clear of that. Um, and I've heard a lot of um, I've heard people say terrible things about each other. Um, sometimes they're true. Sometimes they're not true. There's a lot of envy. There's definitely maliciousness, and there's definitely ignorance. So um, you have to be aware of those things. And the basic code of conduct for our inspectors, um, we are here to support farmers and advancing the mission to abide by confidentiality, try to maintain standards of integrity. We're, f we're here to foster goodwill and cooperation. We're also here to support some suspected fraud and to avoid situations of conflict of interest. Um, after an inspection, so you've, uh, you've been out on the farm, you've seen their operation, you come back with notes, possibly some documents, uh, receipts that you've asked for. So you want to write a report. We use a standard format report here. Um, and that would, I would either write that myself or if it's an inspector who's working for us, that report would come to me and I would review it. Um, sometimes we need to gather more information. There's the, each one of these categories of production there are experts in, um, whether it's vegetable production, fruit trees, small fruits, livestock, dairy, greenhouse. So um, there's a lot to understand, and it will take a long time to sort of build up that knowledge base, and you should definitely work on developing some resources. Um, sometimes there needs to be a follow-up inspection. A producer has to be open to that. That's part of the deal. Um, and sometimes we have to ask for further documentation from them to we go back to the term verifying their production. Um, we have built up some archives here on farmers, um, including all the crop plans, the product list, everything from the applications, um, the reports, the inventories that we have, permits, licenses, photos. Um, and those, I use those. We go back and cross-reference, and it's important to be able to do. So when issues start to emerge, um, now what? It'd be nice if the presentation stopped here. It's like, great, you went out to the farm, there's cows, everything's fine. Um, and unfortunately, sometimes we found out that just because there are cows out on the farm does not mean that they're in production of beef or potentially the volume of dairy that might say they are. So what happens then? Um, you have to adapt, establish the system for what you do at that point. Um, you have to consider what your penalties should be. They should be reasonable and fair, um, but they definitely need to be strong enough to deter those who would break the rules. Um, and then you want to have a system for review so that there can be a feedback loop um, and so that people feel that they are not just being potentially persecuted by management. So I think that's an important aspect to have. Um, at Green Market, our system is, is if I become aware that something might not look right, I let my director know um, just so that he can start thinking about that or that he has that in his mind. Again, there's a lot of information to process here. So to just get some leeway, you don't want to, I don't like letting my director know the whole story at one time. I just like to alert him as I go along so I can keep him informed. Um, again, you want to make sure that you have documented proof. Um, if that's the case, and he and I discuss that, and it sounds like there's a violation, we bring in an, our executive director to discuss that. Um, we do have rules on how these things need to be executed. So the three of us will discuss 
um, the, what the violations are and what the penalty should be. And then our director notifies the producer, and the producer gets a formal letter. We also have, we have a farmer consumer advisory committee at Green Market, um, and that is made up of, I think it's 18 farmers and six consumer members. Um, all of those people get a notification letter as well. Uh, and at that point, the producer has two options. One is that they can accept the penalties, and they can accept the fact that we've given them these violations. Or they can ask for a hearing and have a review, and that review happens in front of our Farmer Consumer Advisory Committee. Um, this brings transparency to the situation. Again, this is where we are accountable to a larger community. This is where our producers don't feel like we're just management coming down on them. Um, and this gives us a level of transparency. Um, our director and myself, we talk frequently about green market as a community and what those expectations are. And I think it's something that we work towards. Um, rather than being punitive, we want people to you know, think of themselves as participants in the program and that it's, it's definitely, um, it's not a given that they can just, that they be here, that there's actually some active part that is required of them to participate in green market. When I started in, the, in this position, one of our farmers who at that time was also somewhat of a mentor had said to me, you know, to as I was just entering the job, that uh, the, this cop theory where everyone will speed if they don't see an enforcement presence and people will at least slow down if they see a cop on the highway. And I think one thing that that alerted me to was that, you know, people will fudge things. I think there's a part of human nature that people will rationalize why it's okay for them to do a little bit more or bring something in that their neighbor has. Um, and you want to, and there's definitely levels of gray. There's a big range of gray where you've got definitely someone who's crossed the line and this is not okay. Um, to no one is getting hurt in the big picture. This is good food. This is from a local farm. This is small potatoes, so to speak. Um, so it was a good point to start with to think that, you know, what do you, what does it take to really get people on board? And I think the first thing is to show that you're paying attention. Um, and show up. And if somebody shows up on the farm, sometimes that's enough to make people sort of straighten up a little bit. And, um, and then you go from there. <laughs> um, so some tools for managers and inspectors to develop your resources. Um, there are a lot of reference materials. Seed catalogs are helpful. Definitely to look at um, it days to maturity um, if you want to figure out how something is in production and how long it would take to get to market. Although I have to say, with there are a lot of advances in agriculture, and um, it can still be very hard. There are no, there, there's no straight up chart that's going to tell you what sort of volume you can expect. There are so many can, variable conditions that are going to impact that, from the soil type, what kind of inputs a farmer is using, how good of a farmer they are. Um, are they using black plastic? Are they using mulch? Are they drip irrigation? There's all these things that may boost their production, or you know, how close is the spacing on their strawberries? So it's um it's tough, but you got to start somewhere and start to get an idea. Um, definitely develop a circle of experts in different categories that can help you with this information. And there's definitely the advocacy organizations. Um, Farmers Market Coalition has good library resources. Um, and there's uh, inspector networks and training, which I think is only going to continue to grow. Um, in terms of this field, I think it's there's going to be more demand for inspectors to be out verifying claims, and verifying production. Um, and nothing takes the place of experience. You have to get in, start looking, start learning. And I find that any time of year is a good time to get out on a farm and to understand 
how it's operating um, and what's happening. Um, there are definitely some hard truths and tough situations doing inspections. Um, certainly one thing to be learning about agriculture, it's a whole other thing to be learning about human nature. Um, and there are some things you definitely struggle with. Um, as I was saying earlier, people will rationalize why it's okay for them to do something. Um, and you are going to have people that you like tell you things that aren't true. Um, and that can be tough. And to um, for someone to be caught, it's an embarrassing situation. Um, I've definitely learned to identify their, the methods of avoidance. If somebody changes the subject or if they are in denial or if they put me on a you know, wild goose chase for something, I know something's up. Um, I know that when I'm, with a, when I'm with a real producer, they generally don't stop talking about their farm or what they're doing. Uh, if somebody is interested in me and my background, I think they're trying to, to avoid the subject because the subject is, is really their farm. Um, and someone who loves what they're doing and they're excited about their do what they're doing rarely has that opportunity. You're kind of a captive audience as well. I've spent a lot of time riding shotgun in, in, in farmers' trucks. And the quietest person will keep me for two hours chatting my ear off. And that's because they're thinking, they just don't stop thinking about how their business is running or how their farm is operating. Um, so that's definitely a, a clue um, is to pay attention to how, how people are distracting you and how they're trying to get you off of maybe some, some fact that you're trying to get to the bottom to. Um, that's not a good time. The other thing I've come to realize is that confrontation itself is difficult. You've probably all experienced that as market managers already. Um, even dra asking direct questions. Um, can be taken as confrontational. Um, and, and people have really, really varied levels of maturity and emotional development as well. And so sometimes it means they're not being straight with you, and sometimes it means that they just have a hard time talking to you. Um, so you learn to sort of navigate which, which situation that is. Um, you want to keep it factual, don't make it personal, and don't take things personally. Um, I know that there's people who don't have very nice things to say about me, but I also know that for the large part, the community respects what I do and they like the job that I'm doing and that's more important to me. Um, um, so to wrap this up and to look at what this means in a big picture, think of the marketplace as a special place and there's really a social contract within the market. Um, and that social contract is between management, market operators, producers, farmers, and ultimately the consumers, the communities that we set our markets up in, and some of the agencies that we work with that are equally invested in, in these markets as we are. So on the management end, we need to be reliable. That means that when we're wrong, we have to admit that we're wrong. I had a tough situation at a hearing where um, one of our managers did not complete the the inventory information, and I had to I had to own it. It fell. The buck stopped with me. Um, I had to own it in that moment. It didn't make me look very good, but on the other hand, it's not worth trying to win that battle because it would just damage my credibility. And so you have to be willing to. Uh, I guess suck it up when you're wrong um, because the trustworthiness is, is more important. And having that cycle where there's some feedback from the producers uh, that needs to be there. Um, and they need to know that you're working for the good of the market and for the mission that you are working towards. On the producer side, um, producers need to be accountable. Uh, they need to be doing what they say they're doing. If they're breaking the rules, there has to be consequences. Um, there have been some situations earlier on where, you know, generally I figure the farmers know way more than we do. Um, and it's going to be a long time before that changes because they're in it every single day, every single moment. 
Um, but when someone knows or when people know that somebody else is cheating, it's really bad for morale. And uh, it's just something that you, you have to get it out of the market um, because it's just it's like a cancer. Um, one of the things that uh, during my training, my organic inspector training, um, an inspector said he acknowledged that you can't possibly absorb all the information all the time, but over time you're going to catch those inconsistencies, whether it's you or several inspectors that go to the same farm and if you cross-reference those reports. So I think that, you know, if somebody's giving you the runaround or if they're lying to you, they're not going to be able to maintain that forever. And I think if you sort of stick with it, make notes of things, um, send somebody else out a few months later, you will find that, um, you know, it's really hard for people to maintain life basically. Um, so finally, the consumer, um, co consumers have to trust that we are who we say we are, that we're providing what we say we're providing. Um, we were talking about this yesterday here at, at uh, Union Square in New York City. We have a Whole Foods right across the street. And I think about that. What, what makes a customer cross the street and come to Green Market instead of Whole Foods? Now, they can get things, you know, to, if you remove the differences of what they have to offer and what our market has to offer. But I think in terms of the product, if they're buying produce, if they're buying grass-fed meats, this all comes back to your brand and who you are, what values are that you're communicating to the customer. And they need to be valued and have to be getting what, what you say you're giving. And that's it. Thank you, Jean. I sure. have learned a ton, and I have to tell you, there are a ton of great questions. Do we have time to take a few of these? Liz, Stacy, are you on? Um, can we keep going for a bit longer? Are you all? Yeah, yeah. Is that I great. Start, okay. Um, going through those questions. Yeah. Let and me. Let me. We, go ahead. Um, if we run out of time, uh, we have five minutes left, and we can go a little bit over, um, and anything that doesn't get addressed, we can um, send out, a, we'll, we'll send out a, a response to um, when I email out all the resources. So let's um, remind people there's a link that they can get to for some of this information that's in their control panel, and that takes them to the FMC site, or, right? Oops. Hello? Yep. <laughs> yep. Okay. Right. Okay. All right. Just want to make sure people know that. So let me start. I see a couple questions here about um, inventorying and about inspections. Specifically, are those uh, procedures that you use for every vendor or at every market, or is that something that you only invoke when there's a question or a concern or you know a sense that something's going on? Um, I'm going to answer that. I'm just seeing this note from. Have people responded to the polls? Did you just address that? I have not seen poll responses. Okay. I don't know how to. Okay. Yeah. There was just a note here, so I'm going to just acknowledge that. Um, we've made, going back to your question on inventories, we do them everywhere, and we try to make them routine because um, if you make them routine, you take away the fear or the stigma that, someone is being looked at or they're getting persecuted or something. If this is routine, we do this, you know, uh, we encourage our managers to do one weekly uh, or to make sure that they inventory. If we have seasonal managers, we ask them to make sure that they do every producer at least twice during the market season, which will be six to eight months depending on when they start with us. And um, it's important to make it routine because it can just be if you only do it when somebody's getting an inspection, that's, that's not very good. So this isn't something you do at every vendor at every market on each market day? No, no. But um, there's, I think I would look at it, that as a mix. We certainly do routine inventories, and then I call for inventories. So if I need an inventory of somebody, I'll, I'll ask for that. And but otherwise, 
market managers should work it in and make sure that they do those regularly. And inspections likewise, are those something that every vendor goes through or only, again, when there's a question? Uh, they're routine. Okay. And also, um, I mean, I have a couple of lists. I have a list that's, you know, who hasn't been seen. I try to go from the, um, the one who has not been seen recently and make sure we get to everybody in a rotation. And then there's those that we have issues or questions about, and um, that's almost a separate list. So I work off of both of those. Lots of questions coming in on the uh, the cost of these inspections, how okay. they're funded, how they're budgeted for, and is is it something that you um, do once a month? Does it does it once? What question? What it means by routine, basically. But let's talk about the cost first. The cost. Well, we have um, we have a I have a department now. I have a de budget a budget for my department. Um, Green Market is largely financed through our farmer fees. We're probably about 85% still. And so that is something that we have a budget for. And I know that not everybody has that. Um, and you know, if we were to do it, I think we're largely underfunded. But I think what it would take was that if there were a lot of problems and we really needed to prioritize tightening up our inspections. But at this point, I think that with, there's myself, I have an assistant, and I have a couple of part-time, very part-time inspectors that I call on. So those inspectors, pretty much to get somebody out into the field, and you have, you have to figure, look at our location, um, to get somebody out of the city to a farm is going to be at least an hour, hour and a half drive, so you have to pay mileage and time. Um, we made an average number of about $200 per inspection. Um, like you're charging the farmer for the inspection, or are you saying when you say we are, $200? We are not. We, if, we have a rule in our books where if, if a farmer is accusing another farmer and it's driving them crazy and he wants us to go check it out, they have to put $200 on the table. And that's sort of a rough number that I think is pretty close to accurate of what it costs. Um, we certainly try to maximize. If I'm in an area, I want to see um, at least two people, three people if I can. Um, but I think it's a, as a community of farmers markets, up ahead, these issues of how to do inspections are going to keep coming up. And if there's ways that we can utilize a field of inspectors, like where you could contract and say, hey, I, you know, I need this inspection done, might be, might be useful to, to other markets. Does that make sense at all? I think that captures a couple of the different questions that have come in. I'm seeing what looks uh, specifically like a kind of an ending screen coming up. Uh, Liz, is that you? Are you telling us that we need to wind things down? No, I'm sorry. That's just okay. the final. I, you guys can keep going with your questions. OK, then we will. Um, uh, I am seeing a couple of coming in here on this process of initiating uh, claims of violations. Do other vendors have forms that they use to do that? Um, what are the processes by which those come in? And maybe you can give us a rough kind of proportion, how many come in from vendors and how many originate with your managers or your staff number, or even customers. The number one way that, that people lodge complaints is, I, could, I would reference that slide called Chatter. They complain. And um, they, you know, people are funny. They don't really don't want to put it in writing. They really, it's, it's very rare. I think I've only seen two, maybe three of those in five years. Um, there's almost becomes this volume. It's like as a manager, once you hear enough of it, you're like, okay, this needs my attention. It's a little bit of the squeaky wheel. Um, and you get to know your producers and you know those people who just like to gossip and you know those people who just like to complain. So, you know, I think we cross-reference a little bit. So that's the informal way. <laughs> and that is that's probably 95% of how complaints are made. Um, and then there's a formal way. And we do have a complaint form. And it would come 
to the director and then it would come to me to follow up on if it were an inspections issue. Um, I have not seen that used once in five years. So generally, that's what happens, or, or someone will talk to my director and then he'll talk to me to follow up on something. Um, can, you, can you speak to an average time uh, from the time maybe that an allegation is raised and the time that an outcome is reached, either it's dismissed, so to speak, or there's a penalty? And could you also give some examples of the kinds of penalties? Sure. Um, time is, that's a tough one to nail down just because there's so much happening and things, we get pulled in so many different directions. So I would say the time is not as, it is not as clear and direct as I would like it to be. If I could, you know, be an inspector that's on one case and can follow that through, things would be very different. Um, but that's not the situation. So it can take weeks. I had somebody that, uh, boy, it probably took at least six months to get violations on them. Okay, I'll, I'll use this as an example. So there was a farmer. Um, I had an inspector go out, and he sort of missed this important area, and it happened to be something that I was doing some research in. So I said, well, did you see this? And he said, no. And I said, okay, well, I'm going to go back and look at it. And then it turned out to be not legit, but I was new to my position. The farmer questioned my, my credentials and my credibility. They wanted an expert. So we found an expert. and. The expert came to the same conclusion. Then there was a hearing. I mean, this was drawn out. This was dramatic. This was drama. And there was a hearing, and um, they still maintained that what they were doing was legit. Um, it was very confusing to our um, com our committee because, and that wasn't a great. It's a process that we're reconsidering because. They were getting the information all at once. And sometimes you need process time for this to settle in your brain and figure out if it makes sense or not. And especially if somebody that you've known for a long time is telling you one thing and somebody else is telling you another thing. Um, and then it, I think by the time that whole Oh boy, from beginning to end, that must have been eight months, I think. <laughs> and some examples of penalties, maybe also how those penalties um, evolved, how they, how they were identified, how a penalty structure was created or built into a policy process, how they evolved? Well, sure. That's, well, we, uh, we inherited, um, I think of us as uh, five years ago, new management, sort of a new generation stepped up. Um, and we did this long review of our rules, and with we call it our compliance section. We inherited that; those were established before us, and so now we've lived with them for five years. And this year, in our rules committee, we're reconsidering whether are those whether or not those are adequate, and they're they're not. We just don't know what to do about it yet. Um, but our penalties for violations: the first one is you get a warning letter. Uh, your second violation, you lose a week at market. Your third violation, you lose a second week. Your fourth, you lose the remainder of the year. And the fifth, you're kicked out of gray market. So the problem with those, though, is that we've had, well, last year we had somebody who is a very good farmer. Um, and I don't know why, but there's a few of these folks that they just can't, I, I don't know if they're competitive or what thing and they want to be the all service stands and have everything. He was bringing in three or four items that he wasn't growing. Now he didn't need, he does not need to be doing that, but he was doing that. And we knew that he was doing that and we finally caught him. Um, and I think we got his attention, which was the main thing. Um, but secondly, so what do we do with these violations? This was peak season. If we give this guy two weeks out of market, he's, we do not want to put him out of business. And that's where we're struggling with what are the appropriate penalties. They need to be strong enough to say, don't do this again. And you don't do it again because you're undercutting other growers. And you know, to me, those are the big ones. If you're undercutting a grower or you're 
deceiving your consumer, those are that's that's black and white. Um, but again, the penalties are. Um, Hope, we'll see where we get on that, but we're we're reconsidering what those are. So it sounds like you have a a, a panel. Or I'm sorry, a committee structure that focuses on specific market policy issues. Can you maybe give us a rundown of the kinds of committee structure that you have within your organization related specifically to the market? Sure, we have within the FCAC. There's uh, the rules and regs committee. And every year, we pick out what our priorities are for the year um, to adjust, address in terms of policy and rules. Um, there's an advocacy committee, which if a farmer, um, if, say if we had to go to a hearing and they needed some guidance and some advice, they could go to that advocacy committee. Um, there's also one on publicity and promotions and people that are working to make our markets better, work with our um, city organizations. Um, I think those are the main ones, main ones that are that are really active. There's a bylaws committee, and they meet maybe once a year. And people actually come to your meetings. That's fabulous. That's yeah. great. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Um, well, Liz and Stacey, I'm seeing it's about 10 after. I'll ask you for some guidance as far as the time. I would say just keep going. When people have to get off, they have to get off, and we can go for another five okay. minutes or so. All right. All right. All right. Um, we have some new folks out there, some, some people who are, are in new management positions. And as I looked at the uh, data that came in as far as uh, our attendees generally, I'm seeing a lot of new markets, um, fairly new in the process, some without an inspection process. How did the inspection process uh, begin? Was it something your markets always did? Or did you initiate that after maybe having been in business for a while? And maybe you had to tell some people that there were changes coming or that the changes were changing them. In other words, were there folks who expected to stay because they were being grandfathered? Or how did that oh, yeah. affect and how did you sure. handle that? Yeah, well, we're still handling that a little bit. I think that um, Green Market is 35 years old now. Mm -hmm. um, so obviously, we're an older organization than probably most people on our call. They, there was an, an inspections um, department before me, and I'm not sure. Actually, I'm, I'm going to find that out. I'm going to find out how that started. Um, and then there was um, some turnover for a couple of years until sort of new management settled in. Um, but during that time, there definitely, you know, I think, I think some people got very comfortable, and they sort of got comfortable, and they kind of also do this. We're, we'll just wait and see what the new management is like. So those are the things that we've been dealing with, and certainly people who feel entitled to green market because they've been here, and we've been slowly sort of changing that um, culture to realizing that you, just because you've been here doesn't mean you are entitled to be here. You still have to be supporting the mission. And um, it's good when those folks realize it's time to go. Sometimes they don't. And then you have to. And then you have to show them why it's time for them to go. So um, any advice? It's not easy. Any I, advice I, I, for the new markets that are starting out? Any any uh, recommendations for the for the new the new folks, people who are maybe in their second and third year, maybe even cobblestone in its fourth year? Any recommendations for starting this process? I think that for starting an inspections process, mm -hmm. I th well, I think so much depends on what your resources are. Um, I think that it's good for market operators. I, you know, there's you can do a farm visit, and a farm visit is not the same as an inspection. A farm visit is still a very valuable thing to do. Um, and I think that, you know, hopefully there will be some more resources in terms of training to, to teach people how to do inspections. It is, it is very, it can be very methodical. You know, if you work through, I always, I, my background's in production in the food business, so 
I always think about, okay, let me give me the raw ingredient and show me how it becomes this final product. And you can think of that in every category that you're in, whether it's a tomato, what does it take to grow that tomato? Like growing it from seed, are there invoices for that seed? Are there invoices for any fertilizer or potting soil? Um, are they buying transplants? Where are they buying the transplants from? Um, is this greenhouse? Is this field? So those are good things to just start thinking with. And then if you're serious about inspections, you want to keep you figure out what you can do within your organizational structure and who's going to do that and keep developing your resources. One very specific question on traceability has to do with um, the use of UPC or PLU numbers. And this individual is wondering if there's been any discussion as to whether farmers are interested in generating that kind of traceability function for their own product. Um, how affordable would that be? Uh, or is that something that um, is just out of range for most growers? I have, I just actually heard about that. I think that was Scott Exo was mentioning that there's some new tools that are going to make that more doable. Other than that, I don't know very much. Um, I know that generally people don't like change, so you have to introduce that, show them what their resources are, explain to them why this would be a good thing to do. Um, I think that would probably become more important if they're selling into a wholesale market or if they're selling to institutions. Um, with direct marketing, I don't think it would be, I can't see it coming online for direct marketing for quite a while. It would, it would hit those other areas first. And, and just for everyone's clarity, direct marketing you define as? That's when the farmer is selling their product direct to the consumer. So farmer's market, generally. Yeah, okay. CSA. CSA, right, OK. All right, well, um, again, I, I guess we'll just keep going. <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm, I'm so delighted to see all these questions. This is tremendous. Um, here's someone asking about whether you verify claims, for example, grass-fed, uh, pastured products, uh, and what criteria do you use for those terms and for that verification process? Um, that's a good question. And there's two, there's two things right now. One is that um, if anybody is claiming third-party verification, they have to have that on file with us. So, for example, if somebody is organic um, or animal welfare approved or certified naturally grown, they can't say that at market. They can't have those signs up at market unless we have that certification. Um, and I start with that because I think grass-fed is one of those that's going to, it has not developed formal criteria yet. It will, um, except under, I think, organic. Um, but I think that someone, I've, I know that our most committed, pastured um, livestock producers are animal welfare approved. Um, it's something that we do pay attention to a lot, and, it, and it's becoming an interesting question in the market in terms of price point also, where you've got someone who's doing an intensive production, and they're selling beef, and then you've got somebody who's not doing an intensive production, and they're maybe using a lot of corn um, um, to feed their animals, and their animals don't have it, access to pasture, even though they're out in a corral. Um, that's really a different product. It's not the same product. And so sometimes I think it's a matter of continuing to educate our producers as well, especially the ones who are practicing the farming that they learned from a previous generation. You know, they'll say pork is pork or beef is beef, and we know now that it's really not. Um, so I think that I'm not sure if I'm answering your question directly. Um, we definitely do take note of how what their production practices are. And I think mostly look out on, in the way that they're advertising that to their customer. We don't we don't tell them how to set price points, but we don't like it when people are making false claims. 
Well, you're suggesting that that concept of verifying really has two components. It, it has to do with production on the one hand, but also the representation, how the product is, is, is marketed and announced. And, and Absolutely. Market at the marketplace. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think we've kind of touched on uh, all of the, the, the broader topics that I've seen coming in uh, in here on the questions. And it's about 20 after, so I'm going to suggest that we start to wind down. I think uh, Stacy or Liz want to present some final closing remarks and make sure everyone knows how to get to the links and use all of the resources that are available, both at the FMC website and through the Green Market. Can I turn it back over to Liz? Sure. Thanks so much, Anne. You did a great job. So did you, June. Thank you guys for your time. Um, we got some really good questions, and it looks like we touched on most of them. So um, if anybody has a question that they, that they posted and didn't get answered, feel free to email me, and I'll make sure that um, you get an answer to your question. Um, I'm Liz at FarmersMarketCoalition.org. And um, I will definitely be sending out the link to this recording. And it will also have a link to the slideshow and a link to the resource page. Um, so thank you, everyone, for your time. And I think this was a fabulous, fabulous webinar. So hopefully we'll see most of you attendees back at our next webinar and we'll send out um, an announcement soon. Thanks so much. Oh, and there is a survey when you um, when you shut down your GoToWebinar screen, a survey will pop up. So please take a minute to respond. Um, we really appreciate it. Thanks. Jim, Have Jim, a great thank day. You for, thank you from me. I enjoyed it. I thought it was great. Appreciate it. Oh, good. Thanks. Okay. Bye. Take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.